Well, you guys are really liking these, which is great because I'm really like. Welcome to another episode of Pook. We're going through, I don't know what we're on now, like chapter 47 or something like that. There's like 70 in this thing, but we'll start off with why. Let's just be friends on mystery, patience, what truly makes a Don Juan. Ooh la la. Second life. Re selfishness, life changing decisions, etc., and securities versus mistakes. Let's get into why. Let's just be friends. Starting off with the quote here She thought of him like a brother because he acted like a brother. Going out of your way to do things for her in a non sexual relationship context is what her brother would do. A woman must see you in a sexual way for any hope to have ro blossomed romance. Uh, this guy Wildfire uses being worthy to date since women will never admit that they are wholly sexual beings. They just express it in that way. The nice guy is going after the girl in some bizarre friendship way. So when you become friends with a chick, it doesn't mean nothing can happen. It rather, when you see the chick because she's hot or whatever is fun in itself, being around her is fun to you, then that's when you go into let's just be friends. The nice guy has fun just being around the hot chick. Don Juan has fun things that he's doing with the hot chick. And that's the difference. This section's good because, I mean, every guy has had this problem. I had my problem with this when I was younger too. You start like walking up to a girl and you act friendly. You talk to her since you've never really had maybe the strongest friendships with guys or you haven't really had like strong networks. You think to approach girls the same way you'd approach guys. Like I want to make friends, so I just take friendly things. But then once you're in that box, she like wires her brain. I don't know how her girls do it with their magic. And they see you as a friend. They see you as a brother. He kind of mentions this anywhere with this like fictional example, which it, if it doesn't resonate with you, then you just haven't talked to enough girls or you married your high school sweetheart, in which case, good for you. Why the hell are you here? Are you not happy? Just saying. The point is you, and I think the whole trick of learning how to be more attractive, especially for introverts, is you learn how to start acting as opposed to saying, you don't just say, Hey, nice shoes. You want to smash or, Hey, I think you're attractive. I would totally love to do you sometime. Let's have some conversation to kill the time. It doesn't really work. It comes off as socially artistic and you're not going to like it. In this case, what you're doing is you're still having those same casual conversations, but because of the way your body language goes, because of the way your internal confidence goes, they called it inner game back in the day. You're seeking to express that you're romantically interested in a girl. But at the same time, you're talking about very mundane things. It's a concept called plausible deniability. And if you have not become familiar with it, you really do need to start. Thing, not the pickup artist. Uh, most people are static. A year from now, they'll probably look the same, act the same, and be the same. But if you're in a state of flux, easily done through a self-improvement or self-discovery, every slot they try to stick you in will fail. Anti-Dump, again, very popular guy from around the time in the So Suave stuff, back when Rolo was just like a pleasant little forum poster. Uh, Anti-Dump advised shy guys to use their quietness as an advantage, not give themselves away. Terminator 911, and these 2000 phrases are awesome. <laughs> use the phrase, the less she knows, the more she wants to know. Now these two were responding to how many guys turn their dates into Oprah and tell their pathetic life stories. So you don't withhold information, you make her work to get it out of you. You are not to dictate your autobiography to her, but you're constantly changing. So after she's dug up a layer, the mountains pushed up three layers higher. She and you are never bored, and the both of you are closer to the stars. Flowery language, but I get what he's going at here. Um, I have been blessed in my life where I've had nonstop adventure. I blame the ADHD where I constantly got very annoyed. I've probably moved a dozen times to half the half the provinces in Canada in as many years. Everything I've noticed is that uh, it's very easy for me to give icebreakers because I'll be able to tell some random stories, you know, stuff that's happened over to me that it may not be the most cool thing that you've ever seen. It may not be the best story, but there's so many different ones. They all kind of just make an interesting thing. Like I remember when I was in Montreal, a friend of mine, she had took me to this group of friends, hers, like instructors, university professors, that kind of stuff. And we're telling some stories. And I was telling a lot of the stories that you'll see in my book, Fuck Files, which is in the description, by the way, go check it out on Amazon. And the guy's like, you know what? I think I believe about half of what you're saying. I'm pretty sure you're, I'm pretty sure you're making this stuff up, which was hilarious because 
I would actually hold back because people just found a lot of the goofy stuff we did was just so ridiculous that it's just not worthwhile. Luckily, she was there. She's like, no, I've been around these boys for years and this is all they talk about. So, but that's the thing. I don't lead with all of these stories because I have too many because I've done things and it's not hard for you to do things. Just do things. The internet was around, cheap travels around, and I get it. The COVID's kind of making it hard if you're watching this a couple years after the fact. And tell you a story someday about how you're not allowed to travel unless you get injected three times and wear a mask, but whatever. Go. Be interesting. Be fun. Do more things. Make more stories, but don't give it away. It took you years to earn this stuff. And so when a girl's just trying to get to know you, make her work for it. Girls love puzzles. They love mysteries. There's a reason why the Netflix documentary about the serial killer is 12 episodes long when you can just say, hey, just so you know, he did it and they caught him, but it took a while and he killed three more chicks. That's no fun. You got to stretch that stuff out over 12 hours of maybe he did, maybe he did. It has to do with patience. These guys failed because they came on entirely too strong, too fast. After a couple dates, they wanted to marry the person. Though they were smooth, they couldn't hold back their desire for a girlfriend. Their woman sensed this and recoiled from them instantly. Women on initial dates simply just want to have fun, have a good time. Men can throw too much attention, too soon, too fast, and scare the woman off. But women find this as desperation. It's the ultimate turnoff with them. So have fun with the woman. Don't take your outings too seriously. A woman must feel comfortable and secure with you before intimacy can begin. The key to her feeling comfortable and secure is by having fun with you. I would, I want to take this in a bit of a different direction, but I found over the years, Red Pill's kind of picked up on this stuff, is guys have completely ridiculous takes when it comes to what's owed to somebody else in a relationship. And I know we don't, men aren't entitled to anything. It's not what I'm talking about. So I'm like, what they think the rules are. So for example, a guy will come into the old married red pill subreddit and he would talk about, he's dating this girl for three months and then she did some weird stuff. Should I use the muse mastery or act like the oak or do like this? And guys are like, dude, you've been dating a girl 90 days. Like I have food in my fridge longer than that. Ditcher. If she's not invested you in the first 90 days, it's like she's telling you all you need to know. She's just there for some quick fun and then to move on. She's not yours. It's just your turn. And guys get ridiculous about this. I've been dating this girl for a while now. Look, here's the way responsibility works in a relationship. And you can thank, I think this is one of the few things you can thank feminism for. They have essentially eroded all the responsibilities for women while adding all the benefits. In a marriage, why wouldn't you, like, you can cheat if you want to, but why? What's the consequence of you doing it? You get caught? Doesn't matter. There's no infidelity walls. They're not in the books. The church won't get mad. In fact, I've seen churches take the girl's side on it. So go figure on that one. It's not the case that your friends will get mad. A lot of the times they're like, they look at you and like, well, what did you do to make her want to cheat? You see examples of that everywhere. So if you think a marriage of, let's say, 15 years, two kids in a house has nothing in the way, of responsibility like that? What makes you think a girlfriend of like a few months is gonna be held to any standard of honor as much as you're seeing it? It's like, dude, if you haven't been dating her for at least a year, you should expect nothing but the most thoughtish behavior. And I'm saying this from personal experience, not just me, but a lot of the other mods, we've used to have talks about this stuff all the time. That how did you end up finding your eventual uh, girlfriend or wife? And it was all the same story. We dated for like a year wasn't exclusively dating and I just kept looking for a reason to ditch her and she just wouldn't give me one over an entire year and then we just ended up together literally you know it just happened here's the funny thing I'm sure you've heard the term women are the gatekeepers of sex and men are the gatekeepers of relationships well you know how often you hear that little story you know women just kind of went out had some fun and then the sex just happened and that's why they cheated and they didn't it's not their fault well in the same way for them, it literally just happened. As a guy, for a relationship, it should almost just happen for you too. And then once you get that moment, and every guy with a good woman's probably had it, you'll start to realize that it just happened. I get it. The women would prefer talking to anybody than be alone. So she'll be receptive to you talking to her. But how you display your interest? With a sonnet? With a pickup line? It's like, no. Keep talking to her but channel your interest through your eyes. And then he has a bit of things here about channels and 
I would suggest giving it a read because he talks about girls as if they're a bosom filled with the milk of whatever. It's flowery language. I'm not going to lie to you here. I wouldn't read it out here because it's cringe as hell. But basically, the first channel is eye contact. The second channel is asking about her. And the third channel is touch. And I love these ones because it's uh, when he talks about it, it's literally the kind of stuff you would see in like the old London day game model or the mystery method or the day bang from Roosh and all that stuff. Guys just systemize these three key points into into more learner friendly methods. That's why I always like the Bruce Lee quote for this one. Like when I first started in art, a kick was just a kick and a punch was just a punch. And then then I was studying the art. A kick's no longer a kick. A punch is no longer a punch. And now that I've mastered the art, a kick is just a kick and a punch is just a punch. So same thing. All these routines are for guys that don't know how to do this stuff naturally or never picked up the skills. And so they kind of systemize it like training wheels. But then once you learn it, you're able to just throw it away. And again, you're back to, oh, just walk up and talk to her, bro. And I love how you can kind of see Pook from the beginning of his uh, book here to the end, kind of displaying this learned self-awareness. And he gives you a hint about it in the very first episode. You should go check it out. Uh, end it, though, on his next quote. He goes, ooh la la. And this is our mission and destiny. Some people have so confused the easy life with the hard life as to think the path of security of walking on eggshells throughout life will make their life easier. But it is when you throw yourself into the fire that you learn everything. But go throw yourself in the fire. Just don't do it to light, light yourself on fire to keep others warm. Charles Bukowski. Jordan Peterson. Neil Strauss. I like these guys. Add some salt to cover up the bitterness of middle-aged soccer moms and put in the oven for 45 minutes. Optionally, you can take from all this stuff what you want and leave the rest. Starts off with, change is hard. Being a nice guy is the easiest thing to do, but in the end, nice guy is a trap. A trap of being in the womb of security like nice guys keep running into. Teen is easy. Change or something new, this is hard. Take your lifelong habits and alter them, it takes some pain. It will be the pain of shrugging off your old life. The life of your parents that they gave you. The life of your school that it gave you. The life your friends shared with you. The one that everybody expects you to live. Everybody except you. You only have one life and a certain amount of time. You may have been raised to believe that life is not meant to be enjoyed or something to bear, be it painfully suffered through. It's the belief that if you're having too much fun, then you're not doing enough stuff. You define your life, not your grandparents, not your church, not your friends. Give up those rules to somebody else. You are to blame if you don't like where you're at. I find this to be probably the most important lesson, especially for younger men. It's the hardest one to articulate. And it really, I swear to God, you just need to have a guy zeroed out before he even understands this. Like it takes a real, a guy will put up with just about anything for the people that have formed his values for him. And they just have to screw them over. That's why for most guys, they never you know, take the red pill and make their life better and become happy and content and do what they have to do. Rational self-egoism until somebody in their life screws them over. Not just a little screw over, like something that's world altering, sucks start a shotgun level of change. And it's annoying because very few people get there without that initial pain, which it is kind of funny to look in retrospect when the guys here are talking about talking to girls is like immense pain when they're like, you don't know pain, man. I've got some stories for you. A lot of guys have their own little Batman stories, and yeah. But he ends off with a really nice line here. It's that most people fake happiness. It's so true. Everybody telling you. You see parents that hate their kids. They rant about how much they drive them nuts all the time. But then, oh, you got to have kids. It's the greatest thing on earth. It's like, I don't get the impression you believe that. Like, I think you're trying to make yourself believe that, and you want me to do it to help you believe that. Same thing with guys that bitch about their wives constantly. Oh, I can't stand her. She's ridiculous. It's like, well, if you hated her so much, why did you pick a bad one, and why are you telling me about it? And they'll go, oh, marriage is the greatest thing ever. you got to do it, too. It's amazing how people will get you to do what they did for a reassurance that they made the right decision when all they're doing is coping for a state of utter, utter despair. Don't let that happen to you. Live your life, make your choices, live with the consequences of them. I guarantee you, even a suboptimal set of choices will make you much happier in the end than following somebody else's life script who's not invested in your life. Brings up the case that men and women aren't the same. Woman committed suicide, it would be a tragedy. 
young man committed suicide. Yeah, ho-hum, just another statistic. And it's like, you're not crazy for thinking this. You've just grown up. Most people never do. Children, remarkably selfish. This is fine. They're children. Growth is seen as the child growing and expanding his or her abilities or schoolwork. However, around the age of 16, especially for girls, they become enchanted with a self-image for themselves. Self-image varies from individual to individual, but the results are the same. To create envy from others, excess pride, material goods, and sexual goods. Narcissism's denial of the self permeates through today's society as you've noticed. How often have you gone on a date with a woman and had her say everything you think she wants you to hear? Or how often do you find guys that act the way they think women want them to act? The technique wielding seducer and the nice guy differ on how they act, but the context of their actions is entirely narcissistic. Even the good girls and the bad girls suffer from this extreme self-image. Reality to them is unseen, which is why they never seem to change once their bodies reach that of an adult. Many people remain narcissistic for their entire lives. It's kind of like a weird, clumsy use of the language when he uses narcissism here, but I do like the way he describes it as extreme identity, which is true because, I mean, there's a great author, better one on this, I would say, The Last Psychiatrist, talks about narcissism and the DSM. The, and that's the manual that psychologists use to define mental illness when they describe narcissistic personality disorder, which I think is renamed to antisocial personality disorder. It's not a good... Like, it's, it's, it's like botany. It's like, what qualities does everybody who have narcissism have? And it's kind of like this weird circular logic, but he makes the case, and it's a really good one, that a narcissist thinks of himself as an identity, but not actually him, the one he's professing, like a director or an actor, and that everybody around him is a set piece, an archetype, all in to cater to this one. And that's why you see a lot of people who act a certain way. You can get mad at them, but it doesn't attack their narcissism because as long as you're fighting for or against them the conversation's about them but if you just deny the reality of it that's when that's when people get mad i think the more accessible way to describe it is pro wrestling you're gonna watch the ultimate warrior you're gonna watch hulk hogan you're gonna watch wrestlemania 7 and if you haven't you should it's the greatest one ever and they're fighting champion of the world two heroes and you get into it and you're like oh the theater of it is great hulk likes that and the ultimate warrior likes that but if you just start looking at it and realize this is just two coked out dudes from the 80s entertaining you for spectacle. That kind of thing would create, if they were in your room, a narcissistic injury. Because no, 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 I'm really the ultimate warrior. I'm really Hulk Hogan. And now you can kind of see where the disorder of it comes from. People basically play acting a fictional role, expecting you to accommodate their delusions. And when you don't, that causes problems. And that's where this big issue is right now. And just remember, your identity is something that's built naturally through the stuff you do. Like you are what you do. You don't decide before you even start. I'm going to be an alpha male. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. My girl needs to be sun hat in a summer. Like, just be you. Make you better in the things that you need to get better in. And then let the identity sort itself out. Other people will sort it out amongst themselves. And chances are it's their ego letting you know what you, what you are to them anyway. They end off securities versus mistakes. Like, what's a security? Calculus on action. Land way of thought. Movement. Talk love. For example, anchoring conversations with notice something about her is a security. It implies that you talk about a necklace or something she's wearing. Your odds for winning are better. Here's another one. Cool fast car. Since it's observed that women like cool fast cars, guys will get them because they believe it boosts their chances of getting the girl. All seduction techniques are securities. All neuro linguistic programming is a security. The entire idea is to boost your chances with a girl. Again, comes to your context on securities versus mistakes. It's like, I ask, what mistakes does a child make? I'm sure you can think of something like forgetting to turn off the lights, not locking the door, leaving the oven on, or something of this sort. This is from the adult's point of view. From the child's point of view, he wasn't making any mistakes. He cut his finger, he hurt his leg, tired out, no mistakes, because he was exploring. Every child likes to explore. There is so much in life to see. A child instinctively knows this. But we somehow overpower this when we get older. You say something wrong with a woman and she leaves, you think you made a mistake and you feel bad. Well, why do you have to feel bad? Everybody's made mistakes, so what? Carl, Black Label Logic, did a great thing. And I'm sure it's like, unless you're watching this live on Sunday, you probably missed it. But we used to talk about this uh, game we'd play with our buddies when we're going to get girls. 
I mean, everybody always says, how would you open this girl? How would you approach this girl? And everybody gives their best lines to impress the dudes, but it's like, try this one. Here's a bunch of girls here. What could you say to get blown out and com like completely shot down? And who can get shot down the best? That one's a little harder because you have to know what, what mistakes are in order to do well. So by doing very well at mistakes, it means you know what the mistakes are and you know how to do better. But again, Losing a girl, getting blown out, getting a drink thrown in your face. This stuff almost never happens anyway. Most of the time, it's just a polite thank you, but I have a boyfriend. And these aren't mistakes. Everything here, even the best blowout gives a great story. Heck, I'm telling you right now, there is money in failing. My one story in my book, which I've talked about already, so I won't talk about it again. But it was just me getting friend zoned by a Dutch girl in Dubai. I was like, this is ridiculous. I wasted like three out of my ten days on those girls. Absolutely nothing to do with it. So I just went out and like, well... Mistakes happen, went out, had a blast, found myself a nice tall girl, six foot four or something like that, crazy, flight attendant. Anyways, not here to brag about me. The point is, make mistakes. The more mistakes you make, the less you make in the future. And for all these securities he's talking about, six-figure income, fancy car, good pickup routine, all this stuff, they're just securities. Don't think of them as anything. And here's the best part. For a lot of guys who earn money, they never know what true desire is because they've never seen it because they focused on just making my fortune, right? It's going to make this money and get my fortune and then the girls will come. You have all these securities and now you don't know if a girl likes you for you or because of the money. I am telling you right now, if you haven't run game by talking to women, been attractive while you had a mattress on the floor and a milk crate for a TV stand in one of your sad MGTOW apartments and you haven't learned what a girl who likes you for and there's no chance she likes you for anything else but who you are and what you've done, then you're never going to know what that looks like when you've actually built yourself a bit of a nest egg, when you bought yourself the car, when you have the nice stuff. So get it done early while you're poor, so that way when you're rich, you don't get taken for granted. And that's about it for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed yourself. I'll keep the preamble and the postamble short. Catch you on the next Sunday. Uh, cheers. Cheers.